So my position at the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary is to help coordinate uh, the Schuylkill Action Network, or what we call SAN. And uh, has, does anyone ever heard of SAN before, the Schuylkill Action Network in this room? You have, you have, great. Well, what it is, is it's a network of a bunch of different organizations, over a hundred different um, partners all coming together to, um, for the same goal of protecting and restoring the Schuylkill River. So it's not its own organization, it's a network of different partners. And it's a non-regulatory network, so um, anyone who's a uh, part of this is doing it um, voluntarily. And how it's organized is around these different work groups, um, which are main topics in the watershed. Um, some of them are water quality issues. So we have um, abandoned mine drainage, which uh, you learned a lot about this morning, um, agriculture work group, education and outreach, um, pathogens and compliance, stormwater, a uh, new recreation work group, and watershed land collaborative, which is focused on land protection. And this is our website, which is schuylkillwaters.org. Um, anyone can become a member um, and get information more about the Schuylkill. Um, you'll get email blasts about our different work groups and project updates. So you just click that uh, Get Involved and uh, put in your information there. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about um, one of our uh, programs that's in the Education and Outreach work group. It's called the Schuylkill Scrub. And it's a cleanup initiative that we have throughout the entire Schuylkill watershed. Uh, it starts on March 1st and goes through May 31st every year. Um, and this is, uh, it's not one cleanup event, it's a um, whole ton of events that are going on throughout the watershed. And we coordinate this initiative, but we do not coordinate each individual event. So we saw the benefit of uh, putting a title to this initiative and getting all these cleanups together to be part of a larger effort. So we can track um, how many cleanups there are, how much trash is removed from the watershed, how many volunteers we have. Um, and it also makes the groups feel like they're part of a larger effort and are making a bigger difference in the watershed. Um, so to give you some history about the Schuylkill Scrub, it was started in 2009 by the Hopewell Big Woods um, Partnership, Green Valley's Watershed Association, and Hay Creek Watershed Association. They first thought of this idea uh, to have a watershed-wide cleanup initiative. And in 2010, we created this Google Scrub website that housed information about what the initiative was and uh, registration for different cleanups. Then in 2011, the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary took over coordinating this initiative and uh, also uh, updated the website some with mapping and uh, calendars to check and see when the cleanups were. And then most recently in 2015, we partnered with Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful. They have a great American cleanup of PA, um, which is a statewide cleanup effort. And this was beneficial for us because uh, we get you know more media coverage for this and. Um, as well as they do too. And also our watershed-wide cleanup effort is part of a larger statewide effort now. Mm -hmm. what, what's your funding source? For the partnership for the Delaware Estuary? No, for the scrub. I mean, are you a subsidiary of uh, the Delaware Estuary? I'm sorry? Are you, are you a subsidiary of the Delaware Estuary? So, what do you get your funds for? So yeah, yeah, we do. We're also, um, we're a national estuary program, so we get some federal consistent funding that way. Um, William Penn Foundation funds a lot of us in the Philadelphia Water Department, too. So the Water Department also contributes? Yes. Um, so being part of the Great American Cleanup of PA initiative, like I was saying, um, was it's beneficial um, because we're part of this larger statewide effort, and um, also previously, we had uh, our registration through our website, and they also had their own, so it was two separate initiatives. And then when we came to partner, we decided to have one registration page uh, to make things easier for uh, people who are registering cleanups. And also, uh, all the PennDOT Adopt-A-Highway programs cleanups, they were not um, part of our Schuylkill Scrub. They were only being counted as a Great American Cleanup of PA, which is a great percentage of cleanup, so we're missing all that data of trash that was collected. 
Um, and also one of the best benefits of partnering with Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful is uh, getting free supplies for people who register cleanups. So you can get free trash bags, gloves, vests, and free or reduced trash disposal from April 16th to May 9th, uh, just for the trash, the free supplies is the whole initiative. How yes. Um, yes, if you register through the, the website, it will show up on our Schuylkill Scrub website and people who are looking to volunteer. What percentage are volunteers? Oh, for, for the Schuylkill Scrub? Yeah. They all are volunteers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what this is. Right, right, but I'm not, the cleanups are individual cleanups, um, and we, we organize the initiative for, the, for all, all the cleanups. We're not coordinating each individual one. Those are volunteer cleanups. We just are getting them all together and seeing what, um, what the volunteers are, their impact on the watershed. Um, yeah? Is there um, any effort to recycle the stuff? Yeah, so that's, that's more on an individual scale on what the um, cleanup coordinators are capable of doing, but yes, we do try and recycle as much as possible. Uh, so what I was saying with the data collection, this is uh, really important for us. We get, uh, Key Pennsylvania Beautiful has been collecting data on their Great American Cleanup for years, so we get data from them on the amount of trash collected, uh, number of volunteers, total events, and this is from last year throughout the whole entire state. So as you can see, um, you know, we had over six million pounds of trash collected in the state of Pennsylvania just through volunteer um, trash cleanup events, which is great. Schuylkill scrub in particular in the Schuylkill watershed last year um, we get this data through them and before we were only getting um, a smaller percentage of this because we weren't getting all those adopt a highway cleanups um, and now we get a larger more impressive number and a better story to tell so last year we had over a thousand events in the five main counties in the Schuylkill watershed um, over 29,000 volunteers with 64,000 bags of trash and what Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful does is they average uh, each bag at 20 pounds. So that's how they get this uh, amount of the, the total number of pounds uh, removed from the watershed. One of the things that we re uh, did this year is we redid our website to make it more user friendly for people. Uh, this is the Google Scrub website. Uh, we have the four main options are to register, clean up, find a clean up for volunteers who are looking to go out and participate in an event, um, a trash hotspot map, which if you're looking to coordinate a cleanup and you don't know where, uh, that will show you places that need cleanups. And then the last part is to win prizes, which I'll go into in a little more. So this is where the register cleanup is. Uh, it actually, like I said, redirects you to Keep Pennsylvania Beautiful's website. Um, so do we have that one seamless uh, registration process. To find a cleanup, you can either do it by location, by looking at the map, by date if you're looking to volunteer for a specific date, or like I said, if you're looking for a location to have a cleanup. So this is what the map looks like. Yes? Would all that information be on any one of those you selected? So if I wanted a certain date, would I have to go get the date and then come back and go get a site and then come back? You know? No, you can, you can look at the calendar. Yeah, they're, yeah, all the information's listed on either one. It's just which way you want to look at it. So if you're, you know, saying you're, you're live in Reading and you want to volunteer at an event near, nearby, you can zoom in and click on that dot and has the information on cleanup name, the time, who to contact to register. And then the same is for um, a specific date. So say you want to volunteer on the 23rd, we have all these cleanups going on, so you can click on that and get all the information there. Yep? I'm curious about, you know, if you've been doing this for a while, what the trends are, are you getting, uh, I don't know what percentage of the watershed you could actually scrub, but 20, 20, 50 percent. If next year you have the same amount of trash, it's always going to be the same, is it increasing, increasing? Well, 
I will say because more people now know about the Google scrub and are now registering their cleanups, we're seeing that more trash is collected, but that's also because you know there's there's more cleanups. So it's until we get um, you know like a, an even out of the same same amount of cleanups per year, I would say that's that's kind of hard to register right now. Yeah, just because it's you know we're trying to boost the initiative more. Right. Yeah, that's another part of this is just to educate people about the litter problem, and it's it's also a first step for people to start caring about other environmental issues. Yes. Um, do you know about United Bikers? Yes. Do they register yes. Yes. Yep. It's coming up. <laughs> It is about United by Blue cleanup, and I'll get into that in a little bit, and Chris will talk a little more about that. I noticed the data again, I heard the data again. Are they young people involved? Yes. And volunteers from the schools? Yes. Is that something you have to arrange ahead of time? I mean, far ahead of time? For this, if you, if you want to get the free supplies, the free trash bags, gloves, and vests, it is recommended that you register at least like two or three weeks in advance for a cleanup. If you're the cleanup coordinator, if you're a volunteer, you can go in and contact who the cleanup coordinator is and see if you can just you know come tomorrow if there's one. Uh, okay, so one of the ways that we promote the Schuylkill Scrub is offering prizes that bring people back to the river. So it's um, more incentive for people to actually register their event here and also we want to build more affinity for the river, so that's why we offer these type of prizes. So this year we're offering um, a two, Moonlight Kayaking Adventure for Two in Maniunk, um, a gift card to Britain Lodge, which is in Douglasville, um, two tickets for Ride for the River, which is a Schuylkill River Heritage event on the 24th, and a gift card to Saucony Creek Brewing Company which is in Cutstown, and they actually have um, the Stonefly IPA, which they created where part of the proceeds go to watershed restoration in Berks County. So what we're trying to do too is learn more about the trash problem in the Schuylkill watershed. Where is it an issue and what types of litter are we finding most commonly? So this year we've launched this tr trash hotspot map where it shows a location, um, details about it, if there's public access, um, how long the trash problem has been there, and any other comments. So um, anyone can go onto our website and fill out one of these forms telling us where they see trash as being a problem. Um, and then you know, it's helpful for us to see where it is and also helpful for people who want to coordinate a cleanup and don't know where to. And then another thing that we're looking to develop is a citizen science sampling method for our trash cleanups. Um, so this would be you know, going through and dissecting a certain percentage of the bags and separating it out based on item, seeing if uh, you know, plastic bags are the biggest issue, plastic bottles, um, I don't know why that's jumping ahead, styrofoam, uh, what have you. So uh, this year we're, we have um, a draft protocol that we're piloting with uh, different cleanup crews. And by next year, we're hoping to actually have a, a finalized program. But um, if anyone is interested in trying out these methods and telling us you know, how they're working, um, please come talk to me afterwards. Uh, we did um, a similar trash sampling at our, uh, the United by Blue cleanup that was at Bartram's Gardens in the beginning of March. Um, we dissected a um, one large recyclable bag to see what was the most prominent types of trash found there. And it's important for us to do this just to learn more about the litter problem. Um, and that will help us develop different educational programs um, in the future. So I'm gonna hand it over to Chris unless anyone has any questions right now. So, um we're going to have a little bit of a two-part presentation, mostly because, as everyone's familiar, Philadelphia is kind of a weird enigma. We're a city and a county. We have kind of our own little way of doing things. We're so much bigger than a lot of the other small organizations or some of the other municipalities. Seven watersheds all drain into Philadelphia before they make it to the Delaware River, which makes um, handling and ensuring that water quality 
coming down is a very big issue for us. So working very proactively with all of our partners throughout the region to may improve water quality, making sure things are coming downstream into the city is very important for us. So today my presentation is all about trash, or as the water department kind of consider, we all think of it as floatable debris. So if you hear me use the word floatables, that's basically everything from cans, plastic bags, tree limbs, all the stuff that floats in the water that can be considered waste, we call floatables. So specifically today, I kind of wanted to kind of go into a little bit more detail about how the water department engages the public about trash, tries to create more awareness, and tries to really drive a lot of our education and volunteer programs. So, you know, Philadelphia has an incredibly diverse community, racially, socioeconomically, just population density. We're also a very geographically diverse city. Every neighborhood has its own character. Priorities are very different when you go to Fishtown versus when you go to Nicetown or Mantua or anywhere else. And you have to be very adaptable in your outreach models to try to make sure that you're engaging the group that you're with and making sure that you're driving your message home while still being very receptive to what's going on with them. So a good example kind of for how to look at this is the city storm drain marking program. Uh, most municipalities in the country are required to do storm drain marking, which you've ever seen probably those little plastic or metal decals on stormwater inlets that educate the public that you shouldn't be dumping things down there. So this is a very kind of basic permit requirement that all municipalities really work on. But it's a good example to kind of show the different approaches we're working on for how to engage people. Because there's a knowledge barrier around stormwater inlets. People don't know that it drains to the river. In Philadelphia, almost, well, we have two different sewer systems. One's combined and one's a separate. So whatever goes down a separated storm sewer inlet goes directly into the creek. So definitely the Pequesing is a big one, as well as some areas in the Wissahickon Hicken as well. Um, if it's raining and a lot of water is going in there, our combined system only has so much capacity before it directly overflows. So we have a combined sewer overflow problem in Philadelphia. So we're talking about raw waste water from your home that gets diluted by storm water, and then it's just discharged into both the Delaware and the Schuylkill rivers. So trying to show that anything you put down there during a rain event or anything could potentially go back into our waterways. Also, most people don't know that Philadelphia gets all of its drinking water from the Delaware and the Schuylkill rivers. So there's not really that cyclical connection between what I put in is what I'm potentially taking out. And also, it's what I'm paying to take out to clean for me to drink and use every day. So challenging historic behavior. Back in the day, it was perfectly acceptable to dump things down your inlet. That was what our sewer system originally assigned to do, was to get waste from somewhere else, to get it to go anywhere else. And that was usually the Delaware or the Schuylkill. Managing community needs versus a reality. A lot of the neighborhoods I work in have many other different community problems. Their recreation centers falling apart. Their sidewalks haven't been touched since the 70s. There's high crime, there's other issues going on there. So, you know, it's looking at what you can do in the moment, how you can provide education, and what resources you can drive to other people to help further those things. It's really hard to deliver a message about water quality when there's so many other problems going on around you in the neighborhood. And also managing expectations. Um, putting down a storm drain marker isn't gonna revolutionary solve all of your trash and your litter and your problems, but it opens a door, it starts a conversation, and it kind of helps you move forward. <coughs> So how do we build support for this stuff? How do I go around and tell everyone that trash is important, it is bad, you should not do this because it pollutes our water and all these things? So I usually kind of go with two different base rules. One is making a local, the city of neighborhoods. You drive that message home, make it relevant and tangible to them. This affects you because you're pulling this from there. You put this in there, it's going to help, it's going to help or hurt you in a certain way. Connection to the water. Um, most people don't realize Philadelphia was a city that was filled with waterways. Waterways, mills, all those different creeks and tributaries from the Wissahickon, the Schuylkill, the Pequesting, the Taconi, all drove industry in Philadelphia. There wouldn't be a city of Philadelphia with all those waterways. Unfortunately, they were polluted and eventually capped and buried underground, and that's what our sewer system is today. But really, all these, these streams, is they're still there. They're just underground. And building that connection helps to drive home this message as well, which is the urbanization. And to be successful, you have to feel a sense of ownership with it. This is my water. This is my neighborhood. This is the tr my trash that I'm picking up. So trying to build those there, and hopefully when you've achieved those, you can start changing the perceptions, which will change behavior and lead to some of those positive outcomes you're looking for. So a good example of this is that storm drain marker again. This was the city storm drain marker. We've had it since, I believe, the late 1990s. The yo fish, very characteristic Philly yo. We've now changed this to be seven storm drain markers. So now each area of the city, each one of our watersheds has its own kind of unique branding and its identity. We're driving that home. I live in a neighborhood. I also live in a watershed. I take responsibility for what goes into that watershed. And I also use what comes out of that watershed to you know, bathe, drink, wash my car, run my business. 
So one of these new programs we're also working on is we have a watershed identity, but we're also, you know, trying to tackle those main sources of where all this stuff comes. Like, what's a really obvious way we get all this, like, trash and floatable debris? And uh, one of our new partners came out this year, the Schuylkill Navy Philadelphia. They're one of the umbrella organizations that manages all the regattas on Boathouse Row and those things. And, you know, got us to thinking, talking with them, just the sheer amount of thousands of plastic bottles they use every single year for, you know, 10 or 15 different regatta events, 100 teams in a regatta. You know, each one of them, two or three bottles of water, they're bringing thousands in for each day. So what, if, what, what could we do to reduce that bottle load? And what we came up with is Philadelphia Water is piloting four new watering kiosks on Kelly Drive, adjacent to a lot of the regatta events and some of the other recreational areas. And for the head of the Schuylkill Regatta, which is the big sort of watershed event, if you pardon the pun, on the Schuylkill every year in Philadelphia, Philadelphia Water, Parks and Recreation, a couple other partners purchased 10,000 re reusable water bottles to give to every single one of the athletes as kind of a way to drive home that message of kind of building and reusing those water bottles. And along with that, too, we've started a different kind of an ad campaign to drive home the fact that, you know, using a reusable bottle is a better way to go. In a lot of cases, Philadelphia water that you come out of a tap that's been treated by the department is actually cleaner than some of the bottled water you find because they're not held to the same kind of treatment restrictions and quality standards that municipal drinking water is. So really trying to kind of drive home that up that there are other options. It, you know, it's not necessarily you're forcing someone to make that change, but you're making it very easy for them to make that change. You're providing things that are kind of getting them to think. It's, working on different ways to inspire that behavior change. And then another way too, we also had a pledge that we um, passed around that Schuylkill Navy helped us come up with to give to each one of the rowers. You know, being a good stewardship for the river. It's my source of, you know, health. Want to continue to help promote the legacy of not only the river, but the events I'm participating in. And I will do my best not to litter and to use the reusable bottles that I have. So as I mentioned before, we're a city of waterways. Um, not so much anymore, but believe it or not, this is what Philadelphia looked like right about the early 1800s. This is what drove the, really the growth um, of Philadelphia. And you can see right now the sort of the major waterways here, Cobbs, the Schuylkill, it was the Hicken, the Tacony right about here, the Questing up top, and the Penny Pack there too. So, I mean, we're still in a lot of ways defined by our watersheds. However, over time, we polluted that water. All those, you know, we saw very clearly this morning from Cherry's presentation, we, you know, there was a place for industry to dump it, we dumped it, and our waterways were it. And eventually they just became so polluted we had to do something with it. So we culverted it all of them. We basically built a sewer underground, built the sewer to, to encompass those waterways, and we buried it. So this is what Philadelphia looks like today. So, you know, my job is to promote a message of healthy waterways, picking up your trash, doing those responsible things. But, you know, if I live right about here, I'm very far away from the water. I'm in a very dense community. You know, for me, I live on blocks. I take a subway to school. I drive a car. But I don't really go to the creeks. There's nothing there for me. There's nothing really at the river. So my job is how do I change that relationship a little bit? And actually, to give you a little bit more perspective too, in 2015, Philadelphia Water collected enough plastics out of all of our waterways to fill a 16 by 32 by five swimming pool. We're talking almost hundreds of tons, if not thousands of tons of just plastic bottles. So one of our new initiatives we're trying to do is we're trying to get people on the water, reestablishing that connection. How do I get someone from Kensington or Allegheny on the Delaware or the Schuylkill? Remember that you know, they're surrounded by water, what makes up our city. So we've worked on a number of different innovative partnerships and programs. The first one we did was a group out of Illinois called Living Lands and Waters. They actually run a fleet of barges up and down the Mississippi River, and they just go up and down the entire length doing cleanups for about seven to eight months every year. Uh, Budweiser actually contracts them to come out every year for the Made in America Music Festival in Philadelphia. And we heard about that, and the partnership for the Delaware Estuary proposed that we get you know, involved, and we helped sponsor a few, oh, actually a full week of cleanups on the Delaware River. So it was August 20th, or sorry, two weeks, rather. Um, August 20th is September 2nd. We did 20 cleanups, both on the New Jersey and the Del or Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River. 237 volunteers participated. And we're talking everyone from water department employees, PDE staff, kids coming from summer recreation programs, Philadelphia Parks and Rec, church groups, you name it, we had everybody. We what do you do with the trash? We, uh, United by Blue specifically actually has partnerships with a number of different firms. So they worked with Bridgestone to recycle all the tires that we found. 
Um, anything plastics and bottles were recycled. A lot of the natural waste we try to find um, different ways to kind of put it back under the riverbank, so large trees and stuff, making sure they weren't going to pose a problem, but you know, you try not to pull as much of that organic debris out as you can. But we recycled wherever we can. Actually, we recycled over 50% of what we pulled out, over about 350 bags was recycled. We pulled about 308 tires out. Those were also recycled. It was about 16 and a half tons of trash in just two weeks. It gives you a sense of just how large of a problem trash really is in our area. And just a few pictures. So one of the great things about this is you actually, you're on the water. You meet at a dock, put on your life jacket, you get a little bit of a talk, you get on a boat, and we take you toward the low tide area of the Delaware, and you're on the shore. You're, you're right on the, you know, in and around the water of the Delaware picking up trash, going in those kind of sandbars and those side areas, which is just so great because you wouldn't necessarily imagine this would be a highly dense urban area. This was right across, you know, in New Jersey, I believe it was Pensacon. So you're right across from one of the old Pico, or I'm sorry, Pico power station plants. Um, Philadelphia Water has one of our major um, wastewater treatment plants directly across from this site. So it really kind of changes your perspective of what you think in your whole urban environment, which was very, very cool to see everyone go through. Yes? I, I would say probably the biggest value of these trips is just reintroducing that sense of water. Um, it takes kind of gradual steps to get people to think of these in sort of larger context. So maybe by second or third trip, they might become more aware or do some of the research. We've had some kids that participate in summer programs with the Fairmont Waterworks, which is the Philadelphia Water Department's educational unit. And they become more self-aware, and they've done you know, projects. And they've gotten involved in Schuylkill Acts and Impacts, which is a great program run by the Partnership for the Delaware Estuary and the SAN. So that consciousness builds over time. But really, this program is just kind of that, you know, wow, I didn't realize that happened. Or I didn't realize when I dropped that bottle, it was going to go in an inlet, which was going to come out here. So it's kind of baby steps, but it's definitely reintroducing there and helping build those steps to get them to that larger kind of piece there. So United by Blue. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, United by Blue is a sustainably sourced clothing company with kind of a mission to do aquatic restoration and trash removal as part of their corporate ethos. So brand new this year, we've started a new partnership with them to address trash collection in Philadelphia. So one of the great things they do is for every unit of materials, goods, clothing they sell every year, they have to remove one pound of trash from a waterway. Um, now this could be anywhere in the country, but since their home base is in Philadelphia, they've kind of started with a new partnership with us to try to really kind of maximize what we can do at home. So for 2016, they're looking to sell 400,000 units, which is 400,000 pounds of trash, or about 200 tons. So quite significant. We've set up at least six cleanups with them this year, and they're also working with the Water Department's Waterways Restoration Team, which we have a specialized crew that goes out and actually handles large cleanup jobs in our waterways, so large short dumping incidents. Um, back in the 90s, they were the crew that used to pull all the cars out of you know, the Taconi and some of the areas in the Cobbs. So group that has a lot of high capacity and lots of power machinery to get in there. And this year, our goal is to do at least 75 tons of trash removal within Philadelphia in our own watersheds, which we're really stoked about. So we had our first event with them on March 1st. It was actually the kickoff event for the Schuylkill Scrub. Uh, we collected a little, almost 13,000 pounds of waste. Um, I will say these numbers are slightly inflated because we did have the waterways restoration team there. So we found a group of people that actually short dumped half a roof of building supplies near the other side of Bartram's Garden. So we went out and collected all of that. We found about 135 tires surrounding Bartram's, the different parking lots and the alleys there. We collected all those. Perhaps the most exciting thing that Virginia will uh, testify to, we found a check for 32 grand. <laughs> Uncashed. Uh, I think they actually destroyed it, just to be on the safe side. Um, you know, it was still within its post date range, so it probably could have gone to a bank, but, you know, uh, that was probably one of the more unique items I think we've all can say we found at a cleanup. So you never know what you'll find out there. But we, we pulled a pretty solid about 10,000 pounds of trash out of there, and not including some of the heavier stuff that had to go in for specialized crew. But, and this was over two hours in an area that's fairly well maintained by the Parks and Recreation Department and also the great staff at Bartram's Garden. So that goes back to that thing, you know, the more you clean, it still comes back because it's adjacent to those waterways. So it's definitely an ongoing issue. And a great picture of all the volunteers we had there. So looking forward, um, the Water Department is really looking to develop as many partnerships as we can. Um, we're, we're mandated by the state and federal governments to do trash remediation and look at where it's going and how to find ways to improve that situation. So any opportunities we can do that, the better. 
Uh, I want to get as many Philadelphians out on the Delaware and the Schuylkill as humanly possible. We just bought a new boat. It's coming next week. It's actually similar to one of the United by Blue skiffs. Um, I'm in Coast Guard classes now to be able to take people out on the river, so I am extremely excited. Come May, I should be able to do that. Uh, explain our floatables management program. We actually have a fleet of boats that goes out on the Delaware and the Schuylkill and just removes plastic bottles. If you've ever seen it down on the waterworks some days, a really odd looking boat with a bunch of clamshells on the front, that's uh, the RE Roy. It's our main floatables boat. It just kind of scoops everything in together. And we have that down to three guys on a pontoon boat with nets that go <laughs> up in the, the non-tidal Schuylkill area and just start breaking things off the banks and the trees. So anywhere we can try to get that trash, we're out to do that. But also just support, promote programs citywide. So you know we're always looking to different, help different support. Um, TTF is doing a cleanup for spring cleanup day. The Tukane County Frankfurt Watershed Partnership. Um, I've heard a few from people from Wissahickon Valley talk about some efforts they have going on. Friends of Wissahickon I know is also planning some different things. Uh, Santa is of course definitely expanding the school scrubs. So any way we can get involved and kind of continue to work with others, we're always on board to do. That was a lot. Anybody have any questions? Question. Yes. How do you handle all the trash that accumulates by the fish ladder, the old fish ladder? The old fish ladder. So that one mostly because it's in the tidal portion of Schuylkill, just below the dam, we can send that boat that has the clams to go get it. Um, that one, I believe, pulled out. Actually, I brought that. Because normally it piles up in that corner there. It so does. To get to it, so it waits till the storm to blow it over mm -hmm. the other side. So we can get in there with a little bit with the boat, and then we also have access. You can get down on a path to just physically, believe it or not, we have one of our favorite things that we love to do with our interns. As soon as they tell me I'm bored, especially between the months of May and October, you tell me you're bored, I'm sending you out with a net. You're going to go pick up trash. So you know we have ways of getting everybody down there to pick up those things. Um, the one vessel I mentioned that had that clamshell actually pulled out 13.6 tons of trash. And it went out about 128 times this last, in 2015. Yes. Um, the United by Blue connects that are going to be like the 75 mm -hmm. tons. Um, are those like open to the public? Or yes. Or United by Blue have, like they have? They're open to everybody. Um, Philadelphia Water and United by Blue, I think the first one we did a lot of social media plugins. Right. But um, if anyone kind of in the wider area, I think at least they are doing some, I think, in the wider area. But at least we're doing six within Philadelphia itself. And I can definitely give my card to anyone and be in touch to spread those opportunities. Yes, yeah. and online too as well. Do you have to get parent parental permission for children to go out on those boats? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I have more waivers than I can possibly take. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And actually, I think they're working on another one before we can actually get them out. So, yeah. you, so far, it's been um, living in the waters of the done. This is the first time the city's looking to do something. So, a lot more lawyers to go with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sir. The scrub is confined to waters, rivers, and streams only. And no playground. No, 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 no it's yeah. not. The Schuylkill scrub is anywhere within the Schuylkill watershed. So any land that's draining to the Schuylkill River, that's all um, a good place to kind of look at. One of one of the great messages that kind of goes into the Schuylkill scrub is really, you know, everywhere eventually makes its way to a lot of water. Um, one of my favorite kind of euphemisms in the city when I'm talking to people about how what the effect trash can have is if you drop a bottle right on the street, it could go into an inlet anywhere within a three block radius of you. Mm -hmm. So you never really quite know where water is going to take things, where it will move things. It's kind of always sort of a, I know when it goes into a pipe because I know where that pipe's going to go, but until it makes it there, it's, you know, it can go anywhere and everywhere. So it's kind of good to drive that because you can do those events in so many different places in a watershed. You know, uh, I guess, I'm more impressed because I really thought that you were just limited to green pickups. Oh no. It's but that includes park pickups and things? Yes, yes. So Virginia has a little bit of so the, it. the school collection network can go in the watershed because I work for a city agency that's chartered to focus on water. I have to stay in the water. So everything I do is always adjacent to a creek or it's on a water next to a water or has something to do with maintaining city infrastructure because that's what we legally have the authority to spend on. Right. right. Yeah, she I can speak that was the Delaware that, that mm -hmm. goal. Yeah, and it, and it goes back to one of the great things about being partners with so many different organizations because you can extend your reach almost infinitely, which is wonderful. Well, I think she had the hand up in the back of the room, I'm sorry. Um, I like live one house, I live in a little house, one, one house away from an inlet that is forever stocked up with crap, leaves, and stuff. Um, 
But I often wonder, because I know there's a lot of little kids that go by, it, is there any reason why there can be a grade on the facing of those endless? Because they always look like they're large enough for a little child to fall into. But because they also get all clogged up without a grade, I often wonder why can't a grade be there to protect mm -hmm. little children, but also I could get some of the crap out that may not go in there if it was a, you know, mm -hmm. if there was, you know, I just, yeah. I'm just saying, I could, as, a, as a resident of that block, I could maybe go get stuff out as opposed to thinking I'm now going to have to go down into the room and stuff, you know, um, stop at the end. I can, I can give you kind of a Philadelphia example just because um, every municipality and where you go is a little bit different. Right. Um, for us, so we actually have a dedicated crew of the waterfront that could, pulls up the covers and inlets and cleans everything out yeah. and pulls them back mm -hmm. out. And we do those, we clean them at least once every three months. Yeah. A lot of work, and some give you more than that depending on the area. One of the things we looked at, uh, we worked with the Center for Watership Protection out of Baltimore and kind of different things we can do to sort of how can we stop trash from getting in the river? What are some easy ways we can do? And you know, Philadelphia has a little bit over 72,000 inlets. So it's a lot. Um, it, part of why you don't do the screen so much is cost, just because you have to go out there and physically inspect, replace, make sure they all work. Um, the other part of it, too, is you know, those screens actually cost things to build up more. So the maintenance and going out and making sure those things are clean would almost probably double, if not more. Um, and the other kind of fun thing, too, to realize about most inlets is, at least for Philadelphia, all of our inlet designs were standardized in 1896. So even though we build and do something new or some replaces occurred, it's the same design that was used in 1896, except for brick, we use precast concrete. They put it just right in. Um, and I have what's called a trap, which is kind of if you're... Please don't laugh my drawing. <laughs> so if this is an inlet, so you have the opening here. As you go down to the box, like this is where everything kind of sits. There's a little stuff and you have some bottles down here. There's actually a little lip that sits in the back kind of right down here. It's called a trap. And it was originally designed to make sure that sewer gases didn't come out. So believe it or not, everything down the street is usually about a temperature difference, about 10 to 15 degrees or so, even in the winter. Um, if you ever smell stuff, that's usually mean that the air pocket has adjusted. So the temperatures are met and that bubbles have popped. So that's usually why you're smelling stuff. But it also, that truck has another thing because it actually catches the bottles. So especially in high rains and stuff like that, the bottles will hit up at the top of that lip and they won't necessarily get down and pull. Unless you have a lot of flow and then it'll pull everything down and through. So actually most inlets have all that little trap there that kind of holds things in a little bit. So it's, it's not always the best solution because, you know, things can still move through there and they do collect down there and we can't always clean as regularly as we want to. But, you know, there is a little bit of kind of built-in ingenuity. And, uh, sir, I think you were... I was wondering if uh, there was any uh, statistics on the age distribution of trash generation. <laughs> I don't know. I've got a lot. <laughs> That's a good one. I have a, a preconception in my mind that mm -hmm. younger people don't pull out of trash. Because I've seen mm -hmm. them even in their cars and throw it out. You know, the one thing I will say is uh, I honestly don't know because you haven't seen those studies, but it's definitely not exclusive to one age group. I know I've been walking home on. One of the great things about living in the city, I can walk to and from work, which is wonderful for me. But you know, I walk past the school, I'll see middle-aged and old janitors dumping waste or mop water, or everything right in those sewer inlets. And you, know, you stop, you talk to them for a few minutes, and it's just you know, it's building that connection that water that goes there ends up somewhere else. Right. Um, and also, I would say with um, older members of the community too. I mean, it was an accepted practice to just dump things right down there. You did your street cleaning, you push it right into an inlet, and it went somewhere else. So there's there's an age gap with everything, and I think constant education, no matter what the age level, definitely does it. But you, you brought up a very interesting point. I would be curious to see if any work was done to judge kind of demographics and ages. Relating to that gentleman's question, how much help can you get from the various townships in enforcing their their fines on littering? Um. Well, I will give the caveat that it's a little hard to answer a political question with a video camera. Um, <laughs> I, I will say that um, every township, and depending, so the state breaks this up into kind of different categories of how things get into water. So what our systems look like. 
So Philadelphia is the big one. We have what's called a phase one permit. So we're the only place in the state that has one of those. But each one of the ones that go down has responsibilities to make sure the trash and stuff doesn't go through. Um, Philadelphia, we're a little bit more lucky because we're a city and a county. So we have more flexibility to do those kind of things. We have more responsibility, but we're more nimble in how we can do things. Or if you look like Cheltenham and Abington, they're a little bit more concerned with you know making sure that their sanitary systems run. They're not having leaks or breaks in their sewer lines or things like that. So trash is important to them, but it's you know they're focusing on also making sure that their core system is working the way it should. So trash is important to everybody, but you know we're able to do a little bit more than some of the others, and we try to help pitch in where we can. But it's a pervasive problem just because our sewers are also designed to just get that waste out, and it goes into the waterways. Well, a lot of the townships have. Yearly cleanups. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah, and um, you know, every little bit helps. It's just that you know, it's that concept that what you pick up comes back, and it's it's sort of like the coal dust there too. You know, we may dredge it all out and we do all those different things, but you know, remember as they were dredging it, we were still dumping it. So you're never going to get all of that stuff until you eventually solve that problem of getting it in there in the first place. And that's what we're all focused on. Yes. If a person was going to intern there, would they be usually affiliated with this, like working on Low River most days, or would they be doing more paperwork type? Uh, one of the great things about, um, so we, we have a couple of different options for interns. Um, they really do everything. So uh, depending on what your major is, uh, we have ones that actually help assist our design unit in rebuilding, repairing, replacing sewers. If you're more green focused, we have ones that help with planning, designing, and building green infrastructure, maintaining green infrastructure. Uh, my co-ops help me with policy work in our watershed areas, developing public education programs, doing cleanup events. Um, and then we also have the watershed field services team and the water restoration team where you're outside every day, you know, picking stuff up and talking to people and just working like crazy. Mm -hmm. So you can do just about everything. Okay. Uh, depending on sort of what you're interested in, what's your major, and kind of how you apply. Uh, can I get your business card up sure. please? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so my question was related to the fact that I know that the water is going to be pipe. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, anywhere where you can have a map of those types of cars so that people can visualize? Like someone who doesn't who lives in an area where it's everything mm -hmm. in the pipe can kind of visualize. Oh, that's where my water's going. Like, mm -hmm. or we do. Have you thought, thought about mapping that out? Or is it we do actually. Um, so the, one of the odd things you wouldn't expect from Philadelphia is we're actually really ahead of um, GIS mapping. The city actually has a lot of open data sharing and mapping, and the water department has a couple specialized maps that are online. Um, either through our educational website, which is phillywatersheds.org, or if you go on to, um, I'm trying to think of this out. I think the Planning Commission's website has the main JS portal, and you can choose through different maps there. But you can see a lot of that. Um, the one thing I will say is, with a little bit of a caveat, is we do have our, we call them our hidden streams, which kind of form the base of the sewer system there. We can't show you everything, just because um, the Patriot Act limits what infrastructure you can share publicly with different people, but you can definitely see the hidden stream maps and where those watersheds used to do. Uh, we also do tours pretty frequently. Um, our archivist and one of our, our public education manager are two huge history buffs. The latest one we did was the window hawking, which if you're ever in the Tacone watershed in the city, and you go to Tacone Creek Park, especially at Iron Ramona, you'll have a almost a two-story out into the Dakota Creek. It was just one of those hidden streams where it all piled up. So, mammoth, you can, about three of me tall to fill it there. It's huge. So, then you get to, the opportunity to see those pictures and learn more about the stories and how they developed. Um, it, water history in Philadelphia were kind of synonymous. You know, I do tours of all of our green infrastructure sites throughout the city, too, as well. And one of my favorite stops to go to is Clydeville Park in Germantown. You're five miles away from the Battle of Germantown spot. And you're in a park that's topology hasn't really changed since the city was born. So it's got a very low-lying area. It's almost like a valley in a park. And that's where part of the Wingahawk Extreme used to run. And we have pictures and we can show you five blocks away of you know early 18, mid-1800s where we dug everything out to put it all back in. Because most of Philadelphia and the areas where a lot of these were weren't really heavily populated until you know, the 20th century. World War II is when the city really just kind of expanded to its real boundaries. A lot of it was farmed. So water plays a really heavy role, and there's always something kind of new to learn about. And we have a lot of cool programs to learn more about it too. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all so much for having us. Thank you.